Good morning, everybody. Just wanted to um, introduce to everybody, uh, just so you know, uh, first time I think for quite a few years that my brother has been in the service. This is my brother Tim, my older brother. And then his son, his oldest son, Ben, is also here today, so we welcome them. Glad that they're here. I want to um, start with a 1987 prophecy that Kenneth Hagin gave. And uh, it, it fits where we're going today. He said this in 1987, Yea, he said, I looked, I looked, I looked, and I saw the hearts of men. And oh, they were disturbed and perplexed. And I saw a black, dark cloud rise up from the eastern part of our nation. And it came out of the capital of our nation, and men responded unto that darkness that arose and walked with it. And that darkness began to envelop the very land. But oh, oh, the hearts of many that know God sense in their spirits. And those of us who stand in the horizon of time shall sound forth a word of warning. And so there shall arise the mighty ones, those called of God separated unto him, and they shall make intercession, and the light shall shine and drive back the darkness. The evil and wicked men shall fall, and there will be those, and remember it was told unto you in advance, it was told unto you years in advance. There are those in high places who will fall down dead. We're on the threshold of that, folks. We're going to see some of these wicked people that have thought they've gotten away with stuff begin to fall over dead. And some shall say, oh, they would have made such a great leader. I cannot understand. But those who know the voice of the Spirit shall rejoice and be glad. For you shall know that the dark, that darkness has been stayed in the hand of the enemy has been defeated. Say, what in the world are you sharing that for? Well, Ushers, do you have the handouts or you already got the handouts? You already have the handouts? You can see I'm going to be talking to you about end times. But I am, uh, no, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wait on that. Whenever you bring up the subject of end times, there's a certain percentage of people who tend to scoff or mock at such a notion. They'll say, oh, yeah, they've been talking about the end times. Yeah, people have misread the signs and have said, well, you know, Jesus is coming such and such a time, Jesus is coming such and such a time. But they were not really looking carefully at the signs. What they saw, and I'll tell you, you something else that you need to learn and understand, that time in the spirit realm is hard to discern. Just like the, the, the vision that God gave me, <laughs> that's probably close to 20 years ago now. And he said, at the end of the vision, he said, get ready, it's coming. And I thought it was within two or three years. It's been 20. And now we're coming right on the threshold of what I saw. And so time is difficult to discern. But signs have been given to us. You have to understand that. But here in 2 Peter chapter 3, if you have your Bibles or your phones or iPads or whatever you have, 2 Peter 3, look at the third verse. It says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own desires. Knowing this and, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Do you know that recently, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, and Stephen Colbert, <laughs> what a piece of work, they got together and were mocking, saying, oh yeah, Christians, 
they, they're talking about the rapture. They, you know, they, they just, they, they just, this is just an escape clause. And they were very mocking about what we say and what's going to happen. And, and this is just part of the prediction. They scoff at what we believe, but when it happens, I don't know that they're going to scoff as much. Amen. You know, when you're traveling now, I'm not talking, you know, so many people have GPS now, but still, when you're traveling, what do you look at to help you find your way? Signs. Okay? Road signs, signs telling you the way to go, street signs, highway signs, highway number signs, signs telling you how to get to your de destination, you know, they... Uh, Ben was coming here this morning and he was probably reading some signs, probably following his GPS also, but signs that says, you know, Princeton so many miles from Elk River and, and so on and so forth. And then if, if you are out on the highway, there's a little, one of those blue highway signs says Eternity Church and has an arrow pointing this way. Well, the same is true concerning end times. There are definite signs the Bible says, will tell you when the end of time is near. You know, people just think that, that things are always going to continue the same way. They're not. And we're on the threshold of the biggest changes that have ever been seen. Amen. Joseph Morris, in his book, End Times Made Easy, lists 79 times signs that the end of times is near. We're going to look at just a few. But before we do, I want you to go to Matthew 16. Matthew, the 16th chapter, I was up, this isn't in my notes, but I was up on the platform and the Holy Spirit reminded me of this scripture. And so I really feel like I'm supposed to read it here. Matthew 16, verse 1. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, Jesus, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He said, answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now, what was the sign of the prophet Jonah? Aha. Matthew 12. Let's just back up to Matthew 12. And uh, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What's in the heart of the earth? Hell. That's the sign of the prophet Jonah. So I'm going to give you the sign. That's the only sign you're going to get. See, they came seeking a sign. Now, we're not seeking signs, but God has given us signs to show us, to warn us, of the times in which we're living. First one, this is a big one. Israel made a nation in 1948. Turn to Jeremiah 30 in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 30. As you have to understand, Jews were scattered all over the earth. All over the earth. Amen. And it did not look like Israel would ever become a nation. Hebrew language had been discarded. Israel was no more, but all of a sudden something began to happen. Verse 1 of Jeremiah 30, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speaks the Lord God of Israel saying, write in a book for yourself all the words which I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, I'll bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers and they shall possess it. Yes. Glory to God. And that's exactly what has happened. They've come back against all odds. 
particularly starting right after World War II. They came from Russia, they came from Germany, you know, whatever Jews were left, they were tired of living in other lands. It's like God, all, if you, those that were interviewed said there was something drawing us back to our homeland. And that was God just drawing them to fulfill this scripture. Look at Luke 21. See, remember this, Luke, you know, um, Israel is always our timepiece. And so when we're wanting to know what time it is in God, look at Israel and what's happening. Luke 21, verse 24. And it says, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And see, from the time that the, all the, the Jews were dispersed, they call it the great dispersal or diaspora. And, uh, well, I read the wrong verse here. I, I was looking down the wrong one. That's the one talking about the next one. Excuse me, verse 29. And he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they're already budding, you, know, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when they see these things happen, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all things take place. Amen. Till all things take place. All right? So Israel, in the Bible, is the fig tree. Amen. And so when, when, he, when the fig tree begins to break forth and bud, that means come back into fruition again. Which happened in what year? 1948. Against all odds, they became a nation. And of course, they've been fiercely opposed the whole time. And then, of course, the second sign is Jerusalem won back in 1967. I just read that verse. Notice it says, Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So you see, when, when Israel was dispersed, the time of Israel was over for that period of time and the time of the Gentile. The word Gentile means person without a covenant. We didn't have a covenant until we accepted Jesus and entered into blood covenant with God through the blood of Jesus. Uh, but we're still Gentiles. We're, not, we're, we're, we're spiritual Jews, but we're not Jews by blood. But the time of the Gentiles, Jerusalem has been under foreign control until 1967. Amen. And what happened in 1967? The Six Day War. Egypt, Syria, and Jordan all came together to team up against Israel. And it was overwhelming odds. But you can look on, you can Google this. I don't have time to get into it. But, you know, they interviewed soldiers in this war. <laughs> and in one place, there were, all, there were 88 tanks coming, and there was one Israeli tank. 88 tanks, and there was only one Israeli tank. And there was nobody to man this tank except for a cook. So he got into the tank and started firing away, you know, doing the best he could. And after a while, he couldn't believe it. This guy come and he's waving a white flag. He says, I want to surrender to your commander. The guy says, who's the highest officer? Well, I guess that's me. <laughs> well, we're overwhelmed. We can't stand all the firing we're getting. And the guy's like, what? It's just me. Oh, no, he said. There was, there was people firing. We, we were getting fired on from all over. So there was angels that were causing fire to go. And, and so God intervened on the behalf of the Israelis. They should have never in the natural won that war, much less in six days. 
They overwhelmed a vastly superior force. Jerusalem was one. Notice all that they were left in. They came to take all of Israel, but Israel took back a whole bunch of their territory. They got the Gaza Strip, Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, and if you look, now you can notice my wonderful wife, if you notice toward the back, there is a map. So you can see different things, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, okay, East Jerusalem, Golan Heights, Sinai Peninsula. They won all that. Now since then, they've given the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt, but they, they gained all of that. <laughs> they not only won the war, they gained back territory that God had promised to Abraham. Now this is very, very significant. Now here, look at verse 32. It says, Assuredly, I say to this generation, but by no means pass away till all things take place. So the generation, and you know, I saw this happen, 1967. I was nine years old. I saw this happen. This generation will not pass away till all things take place. In other words, the end is coming to that generation. Folks, we are privileged to live in the last generation. Glory to God. Third sign, revival of the old Roman Empire. It first began in 1957. Now you think about this. I mean, these countries were fighting each other in World War II. It's very supernatural that these countries came together. I mean, Germany and most of these countries, they cause a lot of damage, but Germany's part of the old Roman Empire. And first they formed the e European Economic Community, the EEC. But then in the 1990s, they formed the European Union, the EU. And they have their own currency now, the euro. Okay? And, and, and this is a fulfillment. Notice Daniel, the book of... Daniel in the Old Testament, right after Ezekiel, Daniel 2.40. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. This is a vision that, that, um, that Daniel saw. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything like iron that crushes. That kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. So this is going to be a very, very powerful uh, group. Uh, Daniel 7, verse 23 It says, then he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on, a fourth kingdom on earth, it shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth. Devour, no kingdom's ever devoured the whole earth. You know, it's interesting. What's the theme of every James Bond movie? Pretty much. Now, it's kind of, they kind of varied a little bit toward the end. But most every other one was what? World domination. Why does that resonate? Because there's an Antichrist that's going to want world domination. That's why you hear all this, you know, 16 airlines uh, combined together to form one world alliance. You can see that if you look. And you'll even hear him say, this airline is part of the one world alliance. If, you, if you're flying in an airplane, listen for that. I think um, American and United and several of the big airlines are part of that one world alliance. See, it, it, you know, you see bumper stickers all the time. Act lo locally, think globally. You see, they're, they're trying to program us toward one world government. Amen. And because, uh, see, in a one world government, they can control all of us. Verse 24, 
And the ten horns are the ten kings who will arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after him. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And he goes on talking about all different kinds of things that the Antichrist is going to do. Amen. But there's a revival of the old Roman Empire, and then if you read Revelation 13, Revelation 17, it also talks about this. But the fact that these have joined together now, this is the old Roman Empire, that they've joined together is another sign that the end is very near. Then uh, the fourth thing is very interesting, the Hebrew language restored. Never before has a language been recovered in this way. The complete revival of the Hebrew language took place in Europe and Palestine toward the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Eliezer ben Yehuda, a Jewish writer, said about 115 years ago, he said this, he said, we need to speak Hebrew here. God put it, I believe, in his heart. And he went on to lead a language revival movement until modern Hebrew was born. He also wrote a dictionary and, and um, um, you know, really was the, the considered the father of the modern Hebrew language. So the Hebrew language restored it. Most dead languages never, ever recover. All right? Very supernatural. Uh, then, uh, fifth sign is Ethiopian Jews brought back to Israel in 1991. Look at Zephaniah. Zephaniah, one of the last books of the Bible. right before Haggai and right after Habakkuk. Zephaniah 3.10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. And then also in Isaiah 43, verse 6. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And that's, you know, not just the Ethiopian ones, but, but all the different peoples that have come. It's a very melting pot of Jews that have come back to Israel. Then Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Verse 24, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. And then I'll sprinkle clean water on you, you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Now, that hasn't, the last part of that hasn't been fulfilled, but he did bring them from all the different countries. It's interesting, nonstop flights of 35 Israeli aircraft transported 14,325 Ethiopian Jews to Israel in 34 hours and four minutes. Very, very supernatural, very, very sudden. All right, sign number six, fertility in the land of Israel. It's so interesting if you have never been to Israel. <laughs> it's just absolutely marvelous because we drove out to the borders of Israel and Israel's green all over. And as soon as you come to the border, it's dry and brown and dead. I mean, if that isn't such a sign of God's blessing, I don't know what is. But here, look in, in the book of Joel now. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 22. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine yield their strength. 
Be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come upon you. The former rain, the latter rain from the first months, the threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Today, Israel produces about 95% of all the crops needed for their own consumption. All right? But here's the interesting thing. Israel exports most of the fruit consumed in Europe. You see how small Israel compared to all the rest of them? They, they, they export most of the fruit. Besides that, they export many of their other crops and, and grain to Europe. They're called the breadbasket of the Middle East. Now, when the Palestinians were living there, it was no bread basket. It was dry. They barely got by. They had a few goats and so on and so forth. <laughs> Talk about the blessing of God. God promised Israel the early and latter rains to, be, to start their crops and to bring them to harvest. Now, we are promised the spiritual early rain, which happened in Acts chapter 2. Amen. The early rain was God's spirit coming, you know, and they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled all the place where they're sitting. And suddenly, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. The spirit gave them utterance. That's the early rain. That's the rain of God's spirit started the church. But now we're going to get the latter rain of God's Spirit that's going to finish up the harvest. We're going to see more people come to Jesus Christ in this latter day harvest than has ever been seen in the history of Christianity. Because there's more people living on the earth. There's seven billion people living on the earth. There's more people to come to Christ. Amen. All right? So, but God promised them the natural early rain and the natural latter rain to, and that's what's happened. They're getting their rains faithfully and they've become the breadbasket of the Middle East. So the fertility of Israel is another sign. Number seven, the seventh sign is the economic prosperity of Israel. If you read the book of Amos and, and Isaiah, it talks about this. Israel has many success stories. I didn't even know some of this stuff. Explosions of creativity producing advances in technology, science, computers, and medicine, such as the MRI. Did you know Israel created the MRI? Magnetic resonating imaging. That's what MRI stands for. The CAT scan, the pill cam, which is a swallowable, swallowable medical camera, the flexible stent. Firewall, which was the original protection against malware, a sniff phone that smells diseases, disk on key, which is the world's first USB drive, water gen, which is a device that produces water from thin air, the Waze, W-A-Z, navigational system, and much more. They, they are constantly coming up with new things. Never before has there been that much creativity except in the United States of America. Amen. Now here's something really interesting. Israel's Golan Heights, they have now discovered that it has the potential to have more oil than Saudi Arabia. Billions of barrels of oil. It's loaded. So they're going to be energy independent and they're going to be able to ship energy all over the world. Because they're going to have more than what they need. Economic prosperity of Israel, seventh sign. Number eight is the rebuilt temple. Daniel 9 and verse 27. You know, I've, I, I just, I, I'm sensing... Just a spirit of skepticism. I mean, what do you want? An engraved invitation? Mailed to your house? I mean, God's giving us signs. He still requires us to walk by faith. You have to be able to perceive these signs. These signs are all here. 
the rebuilt temple. The last time I took a trip to Israel, now this was very hush hush, but um, Tim O'Leary's guide, he'd been guiding him for many, many years, and they had a tremendous relationship. And, and, um, and this guy had all kinds of connections throughout Israel. And he pulled Tim O'Leary aside and he said, you want to see the new rebuilt temple? Folks, they're not going to rebuild the temple. It's already been built. But you know where, see, now, they, they, what's the problem with rebuilding the temple? Originally. What's sitting on the temple site? The Dome of the Rock which is one of the holiest Muslim sites in the world. So what are you going to do? Bomb that thing? If they did, millions of Muslims would descend upon them from all over the world. So they're going, wait a minute. There's got to be a way to do this. And they thought, you know what? Let's do some measuring. And so they started doing some measuring, and they found out, you know what? The, the temple site wasn't exactly where we thought it was. And they thought, you know what? What if we did something underground? We could do it on the temple site, but it would be underground. And that way we wouldn't disturb anything. One of my greatest regrets is that we were scheduled. Our tour group, Tim O'Leary and our tour group, was scheduled to go and see the rebuilt temple. Gentiles in the temple. Can you believe that? And some, there was an incident that happened that prevented us. They had to tighten security and we couldn't get in. <clears throat> I would have loved, I would have loved to have seen the Ark of the Covenant, the golden candlestick, all the different, because they had all the furniture, all the furniture's back from the holy place and the holy of holies. They're not ready to start sacrifices, they're already doing it, folks. It's already happening. It's just underground. The one thing we did do is we walked up to their security gate. Man, did they have security. They don't want this to be known because they still think the Muslims are going to have a problem with it if they discover it. But it's rebuilt. Daniel 9, verse 27, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for, for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations there shall be one who makes desolate, even the consummation which is determined and poured out on the desolate. In other words, the Antichrist is going to say there would be no more sacrifice. He's going to offer an unclean animal, probably a pig, on the altar. And that's called the abomination of desolation. And it's, it's going to shock because, see, they're, up till that point, you have to understand, people say, oh, this person's the Antichrist, this person's the Antichrist. No, they have the spirit of Antichrist. We're, until we're raptured out of here, the Antichrist is not going to come forth. He's going to remain hidden. But he's here. If you have any spiritual sensitivity, the Antichrist is here. He's on the earth. And that's why we're seeing the rise of the spirit of Antichrist. Amen. In leaders all over the world. But the Antichrist is going to be a different cat. And, uh, but he's going to come and he's going to, if they're going to receive him because he's Jewish. He has to be Jewish. They're not going to receive anybody but a Jewish Messiah. And they're going to think that, oh, because he makes peace and, you know, all this. First three and a half years of the tribulation is not going to be as terrible. But in the middle of the tribulation, he's going to come. and He's going to offer this unclean sacrifice on the altar. And they're going to go, oh, we thought he was the Antichrist, or we thought he was the Christ, the Messiah. And they're going to be shocked. And it says that they're going to flee. And you know where they're going to flee to? Petra. An old town that's still, you know, it's, it's a, has anybody here been to Petra? It's a, it's a World Heritage Site. And they're going to flee to Petra. 
And God's going to protect them there. Amen. But the rebuilt temple, and they're going to, you know, they've had, uh, uh, well, if you notice the sign number 10, Temple Mount Institute prepares for temple worship. That was in 1987. Why did they start so early? Because they, they were already excavating out the temple and building it and getting it all prepared to specifications. And by the time I was there in the 1990s, it was already done. Amen. Uh, look at 1131 of Daniel. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifice and place there the abomination of desolation. That's that unclean sacrifice that he's going to offer again in Daniel 12, 11. And from that time that the da daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. In other words, that's exactly half. And that's why the last three and a half years are going to be very, very difficult of the seven years of tribulation. Amen. Number nine sign. You might think this is not a big deal, but it is. Uh, foxes seen walking on the Temple Mount. L Lamentations, that's right after the book of Jeremiah. Lamentations 5. To understand when the presence of God was in the temple, foxes would not come near. But foxes were seen. Notice here in verse 18, because of Mount Zion, which is desolate, that's the, Mount Zion is the temple mount, with foxes walking about on it. The Jerusalem Post reported this on 8819. They had seen foxes, and it was a sign of the end. And then uh, I said that the Temple Mount Institute prepares for temple worship. Here's an interesting fact. A group of men named Cohen searched out their lineage and found out they descended from a line of priests. In other words, that have to be of the line of who? Levi, which was the son of Aaron. Amen. All priests came from that lineage. And so they've got the, the, the priests who are of the lineage of Levi and Aaron. And so they've got everything in order. It's already happening. Okay? Now, we need to shift gears just a little bit. That's 10 signs. If you want to, you can order the book from Joseph Morris. So, you know, it talks about end times made easy. And it talks about all the other signs that are, in, that are talking about how close we are to the end. But then there's the rapture, which is the catching away of the church. The term rapture is not used in the Bible, but is a term used to refer to the extreme measure of joy and excitement each believer will experience as they're caught up to meet Jesus in the air. Yes. See, that's, I mean, we're going to get caught up. I mean, the Bible says we're going to be changed in the end. We're going to go from a mortal body to an immortal body like that, as fast as you can snap your finger. In the twinkling of an eye, faster than the speed of sound. It's at the speed of light we're going to be changed. And then we're going to rise up. Y'all ready for rapture practice? <laughs> Hallelujah. But see, it's, it's, the term rapture is used because of the extreme joy and excitement. Because we're going to be seeing Jesus up in the air. See, this is not the second coming of Christ. Because the second coming of Christ, what does Jesus do? He actually comes to the ground. He plants his feet on the Mount of Olives. This is rising up to meet Jesus in the air. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. People say, oh, I don't believe in the rapture. Be careful. Some people believe if you don't believe in the rapture, you're going to stay here. Because this is a step we take by faith. Yeah. So be careful. You don't want to go through the tribulation, folks. Trust me. Right. Oh, man. 
Just imagine the worst, if you could imagine the worst 100 days of your life and compress it into one, one day uh, during the tribulation would be 100,000 times worse. It's going to be so bad. First Corinthians or First Thessalonians four verse thirteen. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. That's the problem. Anytime Paul says, "I don't want you to be ignorant," most people are. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Now, there's no such thing as soul sleep. Amen. This is talking about your body. You ever seen somebody laying in a coffin? Don't they look like they're asleep? That's what they are. Their, their body is sleeping. Why? Because there's going to come a day they're all going to get woke up. You're going to get your body back. Even, even the ungodly is going to get their body back, but they're going to live forever in torment. And that's why we want to reach as many as people as we possibly can. We who are alive... Oh, uh, wait a minute. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we are alive and remain, that's all of us, until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Rise first. We're going to rise up to meet him. Then we are alive and, and remain, shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Everybody say in the air. See, he's not, this is not the second coming. And thus shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. See, I'll tell you, the Bible says, and I believe it's uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Just a minute. Yeah, 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. See, the church is not designed to go through the tribulation. Amen. Thank God. Now, let me ask you a question. Okay, Matt, you just got married. Okay? You love Carly? You want to care for her, protect her? Does he love you? Yeah? Does he care for you and protect you? Okay, so... Matt has a chance to keep you from great trouble and hurt, okay? But he just leaves you in that spot to go through that trouble and hurt. Would you wonder if he loved you very much if he did that? Yeah. See, I'll tell you, you know, God's a better, a better uh, Jesus is a better husband than we are to, 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 you know, I try to be a good husband to my wife, but Jesus is a better husband than, than, than I could ever be. And we've not been appointed to wrath. And you see, the, the, the seven years of tribulation is God's wrath being poured out in the ungodly. 2,000 years of wrath have been stored up. There's containers in heaven where God's anger and wrath have been stored up. If you read the book of Revelation, look. It talks about containers. You say, how in the world can you contain wrath? I don't know, but God can. And the Bible says that it's poured out different containers and those different judgments that come upon the earth. It's God's wrath being poured out in the ungodly. See, we live under an age of grace and mercy. And we have lived, and, and see, now people have, have abused God's grace and mercy. God's grace and mercy are given to us so we can grow without becoming a crispy critter just because we, you know, you look under the old covenant, man, I'll tell you, judgment came quick. You were caught in adultery, they picked up stones and stoned you to death. They were ready to do that to the woman caught in adultery that they brought to Jesus. But Jesus reached into the age of grace and grabbed a hold of some grace and mercy because the age of law and the age of grace were colliding. Just like right now, the age of grace and the age of law, the age of the tribulation, the seven years of tribulation, are colliding. And that's why we're going to see, see, under the, the seven years of tribulation, we're going to see God in a different light. Because all of a sudden, we go back to law. Because it's Israel's the center, not the church anymore. 
Because we're up in heaven, which I'll talk about in a minute. Amen. Let's look at another verse, 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I shall tell you a mystery. Now, anytime you see the word mystery in the Bible, it does not mean what we think of mystery, something you can't understand. The word mystery means something previously hidden, now made known. Behold, I shall show you something previously hidden, but now made known. We shall not all sleep. Not, there's some of us not going to experience physical death. That's okay with me. And is it okay with you that you don't have to go through physical death? Yeah. Okay. We shall not all experience physical death, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. See, that's the thing. The one thing you're going to hear that's going to let you know the rapture is you're going to hear the trump of God. Now, the world's not going to hear it. But it's going to cause us to look up. And we'll see Jesus. And then, boom! Quicker than you can snap your finger, we're going to be changed, and then we're going to rise to meet, him in the Lord, meet the Lord in the air. I like what some preachers say. I hope I'm standing close to a sinner because I'm going to grab onto a sinner and say, okay, if you don't repent, when I get up about 100 feet or more, I'll let go. And just preach to them as you're going up. You won't have time to do that, but it sounds good. It's kind of cute. All right? For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. So in other words, people whose body, the bodies of those people who have already died are going to be raised incorruptible. They're going to get their glorified bodies. Now, you say, well, why when they went to heaven didn't they get their glorified bodies? Because their bodies are part of what? The earth. Until this age, the last six uh, uh, years of the 6,000 year lease that God gave to Adam is complete, our bodies are part of that. This is, the release is done, so no longer does a, that have a hold on our body. See, God does everything legally. You have to understand that. If you don't understand that God does everything legally, you won't understand the Bible. This is a legal document. This is a covenant, a blood covenant, the new blood covenant, the old blood covenant. God has to do things legally. But the, Trump's going to be, the trumpet's going to sound, the dead are going to be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We're going to go from corruption to incorruption quicker than you can... Snap your fingers. And when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortal, the word mortal means death doomed, is put on immortality, not subject to death, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, or hell, where is your victory? Glory to God. And so we're going to enjoy the rapture, the catching away of the church, which is not the second coming of Christ. The rapture happens just before the seven years of tribulation. Amen. Or the time, also in the Bible refers to that as the time of Jacob's trouble. Amen. Jacob referring to Israel. And they're going to have trouble. But God's going to intervene. Because see, what's going to happen right after the rapture? Well, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Russia, Iran, Turkey. And do you, have you noticed Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming all kinds of alliances these days? Why do you, anybody know why Russia took the Crimea? The Crimean Peninsula? They took it because it's the pathway to get to Israel. Iran's talking about using nuclear weapons to wipe Israel off the map. They're making no bones about it. Turkey has been rattling its sabers. They've got a new Muslim leader now. I can't pronounce his name. I could if it was written down. But anyway, they're rattling their sabers. See, they're all predicted to come down. Ezekiel 38 and 39. 
Syria is going to be part of it. And when Syria starts moving against Israel, Israel is going to use their nu nuclear weapons and wipe out Damascus. I think it's Israel 17, or, uh, Isaiah 17, it says, Damascus becomes a ruinous heap. It's never, ever been a ruinous heap. It's one of the longest standing cities in the world. It's never been a ruinous heap. But it's going to become a ruinous heap because they're going to get hit by a nuclear weapon. Because Israel is going to get desperate. And when Israel hits Damascus with a nuclear weapon, all these other, Gog and Magog, which is Russia, and Turkey, and uh, Iran, and some of those other countries are going to come against Israel, and God is going to intervene supernaturally. It's going to be hailstones, huge hailstones that are come, come down and just wipe them out. And it's all going to be seen on television. Glory to God. And the Jews are going to know that God is preserving them. But you have to understand the rapture is necessary to happen first, so we who have authority and are withholding or restraining, whichever translation you have, the Antichrist from manifesting must be removed from the earth. Let me show you what I'm talking about. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, people who don't understand the authority we've been given in Christ, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 28? Verse 18, he said, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. But then he didn't keep it. He said, You go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The end of the age. He didn't keep that authority. He had stripped it from Satan, but he immediately conferred it upon the church. Most of the church don't realize, they don't realize that they have authority in Christ. Glory to God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that's the rapture, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Some people were saying, oh, the day of Christ had already come. Jesus already returned. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless a great departure comes first and the man of sin is revealed. That word in the Greek where most of the time they translate it falling away, great departure. And I believe that's the rapture. Great departure comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The Antichrist isn't going to be revealed until we leave. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God or is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you when I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining. That he may be revealed in his own time. The mystery of lawlessness already at work. See the... The Antichrist is our, we have leaders with the spirit of Antichrist. We have a particular leader that Robin Bullock, who I respect as a prophet, says is the closest thing to the Antichrist that's ever been. Mm -hmm. She whispered it. I'm not going to say. If you want to get uh, his book, the, Robin Bullock's book, The Pool and the Portal, he talks about who that is. So you can, but he says he's not the Antichrist. People are saying, oh, he's the Antichrist. No, he's not. He's not going to be revealed until we're out of here. But notice, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So the Antichrist, they're trying, this, this, the spirits are trying to get things in order for this one world government. And so you can't be bothered by the fact that some of these things are coming into place. It's just that we're going to, we're, we're going to, they're trying to move it too fast and we're going to say, whoa, Nelly. No, not yet. And that's why this midterm election is so important for us to withhold or restrain this mystery of lawlessness that's trying to work. Oh, so much more I could say, but I can't. Glory to God. And the lawless one will be revealed, verse 8, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
But he's going to be here, and he is going to, you know, the Antichrist is the, um, Satan's attempt at Jesus. See, the devil's just a copycat. That's all he knows how to do. Amen. But then, when the rapture happens, the church of Jesus Christ will then, as the bride of Christ, be joined with Jesus at the marriage of the Lamb and the church, after which we'll enjoy the seven-year marriage feast. It's going to be a feast like none other. You know, in heaven, it's so nice we can eat and we don't gain weight. Glorified bodies, we just eat for pleasure. We don't eat because we need it. We just eat, glory to God, just for the fun of it. And all this will be happening in heaven while the world's experiencing, while the earth is experiencing seven years of tribulation. The seven years of tribulation is God's masterpiece of judgment. See, for a long time, I thought the, the, the seven years of tribulation was um, the devil's heyday, and it's not. It's God's masterpiece of judgment on the wicked and the wooing of Israel by Jesus to see them finally as their Messiah. Look at Zechariah in the Old Testament 12. Zechariah 12. Zechariah is right before Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. They're going to look on Jesus. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Why are they going to mourn and grieve? Because they're going to go, oh, we could have, we could have had him as Messiah when he came the first time. And they rejected him. Amen. All right, now I have to go fairly fast in this last part. In, after the seven years of tribulation, Jesus and his bride will come back to the earth. And that's where, you have to look at those verses, I don't have time, but we come back and Jesus judges, you know, at the Valley of Megiddo. I've been to the Valley of Megiddo. Man, I'll tell you, you can just sense destiny there. So we were up in this high point, and we looked down in the Valley of Megiddo. That's where the Battle of Armageddon is going to come. Okay? The, the Battle of Armageddon. And, uh, and God, out of his mouth, uh, Jesus is going to bring judgment out of his mouth. And the Bible says that it's going to wipe out the Antichrist, his armies, and the blood is going to be up to the, bri the horse's bridle in depth. Do you know there's already f over 500 species of flesh-eating birds that are, gonna, are there. They've never had that many in Israel. They're there to clean up the mess. They're already there. Glory to God. And it's going to be quite a mess. Then we go to a new heaven and a new earth after a thousand-year reign of Christ and the church. Satan is chained in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And then we reign with Christ for a thousand years. You can look at those scriptures. After the thousand years, Satan is released from prison, goes out and deceives the peoples of the earth, and they come and surround the camps of the camp of the saints. Now, think about this, people. Okay, God Himself, Jesus, has been visibly present with these peoples for a thousand years. There's not going to be any death. And the devil's going to go out and he's going to listen to them and deceive them. They're going to come up against the camp of the saints and fire from heaven is going to come down and consume them all. Hmm. And the devil's cast in a lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet to be tormented forever with the Antichrist. And all those who died without Christ are brought before the great right throne of judgment. We don't appear before the great white throne of judgment. We appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of did we do what God told us to do. But the great white throne of judgment is for degrees of punishment in hell. There's degrees. Those who just didn't know, didn't have somebody tell them are going to get lesser punishment. People like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin that were the, you know, the, 
the tools, the instruments of thousands of people, millions of people dying are going to get a much worse punishment. Oh, I don't, I, oh, there's so much more I want to say, but I've just got to finish up here. God refurbishes heaven and earth. That's Revelation 21.1. No more sea. There's not going to be any sea. Probably lakes, but no sea. Then the holy city, the heavenly Jerusalem, comes down from heaven. And that's us in that, that heavenly city. And uh, we're prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. God dwells with men for all eternity. No more tears, no more death or sorrow, no more pain, for all the former things are passed away. He makes all things new. This is all for the overcomer, verses 6 and 7. God, then God puts on a show for all eternity. Don't think that we're going to sit on clouds and play harps. We're going to have fun. We're going to do fun things. There's going to be activity. We're going to have responsibilities. We're going to, you know, but, but we're going to have lots of fun. Amen. And, and then God's going to put on a show for us. You know, when my grandkids come over, my wife and I, we try to do some special things so that they, it's memorable for them. Well, how much more? You know how creative our Heavenly Father is? Can you imagine? Just when we think we've seen it all, God will do something new and we go, whoa, that was really cool. And then the next day he'll do something even greater and it just, it'll just keep happening throughout all eternity. And whew. Look at Ephesians 2, 7. We'll close with this verse. That in the ages to come, he, that's God, might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God's just going to show us that through all. He's just going to love on us for all eternity. I mean, but folks, here's what I want you to see. You know, it's like Joseph Morris says when he came and taught on end times. He says this. He says, you know, when you, when you get to the end of a race, you don't slow down. You don't sit down. The end of the race, you, you give it everything you've got. You give it the kick to win the race, right? If you're running to win... Well, see, folks, we're at, we can see the finish line finally. And now is not the time to back off, slow down, get distracted, pull back. It's time to speed up. It's time to find our place in what we're supposed to do and be committed. Committed. Yeah, I know. The atmosphere is more difficult than it's ever been. And that's the way it's going to be. It's going to get, folks, it's not going to get necessarily better in the natural, but in the spiritual it's going to get better. And that's why we have to walk closely with God. You're not going to find your peace, even though I'm not saying you can go to a lake or whatever or you know, we do need to get vacations in. But folks, we're going to have to get the peace and the strength and the, the, the grace from God to be able to handle it. You know, the Bible says where sin does abound, grace does that much more abound. So we need to get that abundance grace and God's going to cause us to overcome. And uh, glory to God, we're going to... See, God chose you. Yes, amen. He chose you. You're born. You've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. You know, all the prophets and stuff are jealous of you that you get to live in this time. Moses is jealous of Judy because she gets to live in this time. King David's jealous of Bodhi because he gets to live in this time. They all want to live in this. The Apostle Paul's Jealous of Jeremy because he gets to live in this time. They all want it. They all see this far off. Want God chose you and me to live in this time. So what are you going to do about it? It's getting more intense. 
And so we need to be ready to respond to that intensity. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Father, I pray for every person here and every person of this church that's not here this morning, that, Father, that they will see with their spiritual eyes how close we are to the end how close we are to the latter rain outpouring. That's going to be bigger and greater and more powerful than anything this earth has ever seen. And I thank you, Father, that as their eyes are open, that you show them what their part is and what you want them to do. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one. Show them how much you love them, how much you care for them, but how much you need them to be your mouthpiece, your hands, your feet, your representatives doing the work of God in the earth because you've chosen to work through men, women, boys, and girls. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. We're going to go ahead and receive our offering this morning. This is our chance to honor God with tithes and offerings. And so we're going to pray and just ask God to direct us. Father, we thank you so much for how good you are. And we're so thankful that we're saved and that we're washed in the blood of the Lamb and that we're on our way to heaven, that we have eyes to see the upcoming rapture and, and all that you want to do before that time to win as many people as possible to you. We just thank you now that we can sow seed toward that end. Thank you, Father, for directing each one, giving them grace to give. In Jesus' name, and everybody agrees with that said? Amen. Amen. If you're making out a check this morning, make it out to Eternity Church or Market EC. If you're giving cash, want a tax-deductible receipt, raise your hand. One of the ushers will give you an envelope. Just keep your hand up until they get to you. If you're here for the first time, we extend a special welcome to you. We're very, very glad that you're here this morning. And... Uh, We've been doing, a, we, we, this, this is actually, I think, number seven of the foundational connections classes. We, we, we're not going to be doing membership, so I'm doing some basic teachings that we feel are necessary for everybody to hear in order to understand where we're coming from in this church and what we believe. And so this is number seven of that. That's why I, I try to capsulate as much and condense it as much as possible without watering it down at all. Amen. So this is number seven. Glory to God. Uh, just want to remind you, uh, we've been talking about uh, finding God's plan, His purpose for us, and pursuing that on Wednesday nights. And so that's Wednesday night, Believer's Night. Also, that's when the youth meet. So if you have a youth age, you want to make sure you get them here on Wednesday nights. And then um, Saturday night, we have Saturday night prayer. Uh, we're praying for the United States of America by the direction of the Lord. And uh, this, notice what, one of the things that Kenneth Hagin said in his prophecy, by intercession, us praying, taking hold with the Holy Spirit, that, that this country is going to get turned around. And so that's what we're doing. We're following his directive. Amen. So that's Saturday night. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And then, uh, Ali, are you going to be doing announcements? Yeah, so she's going to be doing an uh, announcement. My wife is on a bit of a little re mini retreat, is by herself, kind of getting some things done and and uh, seeking God some and and so forth. So, all right, let's all stand. Let's present our tithes and offerings to Him. Say this out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I bring my tithes. I give my offerings according to your word, to obey you with a willing heart. And you said, if I be willing and obedient, I will eat the good of the land. And I thank you for the good of the land coming on to me in Jesus' name so I can be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.